there we go yes <laughs> and this is by far the smoothest transition ever <laughs> <laughs> So we've we've been we've been challenged with with the, with this whole approach. For those of you who are listening to this recording, um, um, all of these live meets we're doing them on Discord. And the nice thing about Discord is it offers you the um, well the opportunity to actually have this live conversation with an audience, with audience interaction, and all that. But it's always a bit of a of a gamble where whether people meet up in the same room again so uh clemens thanks so much this is this is already a great start <laughs> yeah great to be here <laughs> oh perfect perfect let me just oh geez now my my colleagues from work are starting to bother me as well so i need to uh it always to, happens yeah. well it always happens at the same time right so one thing i need to do is i need yeah. to quickly mute my phones and all those kind of things and then we'll there we go here we go so we already um so we we've started the room so everything is is, is a-okay i've got the recording running um so yeah. if you if you're ready then i would say uh let's get this show on the road shall we yeah let's do it so um ladies and gentlemen or other pronouns that might be let's start again shall we hi everyone <laughs> That's Hello. probably like the most in inclusive thing I could say currently. Uh, today is going to be a very special show and a very special edition of the Modular Clubhouse because I'm joined uh, by my oldest friend, Clemens Weyers. Clemens, thanks so much for joining. How are you? Very good, and uh, it's super cool uh, that we can do this. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <Super cool. laughs> it's always it's always a bit odd when the two of us have to talk English, right? It's always that's always a bit of a <laughs> it yeah. feels. It feels. Just we are feels used to uh, to Dutch and uh, maybe even a little bit of dialect. Uh, yeah, between, indeed, um, indeed. Uh, and that's yeah, of course but, always uh, a bit of a thing. So, how long have we known each other? Thirty, thirty-four years, six, uh, some, yeah, something, something like, like that. that. I think when we were <laughs> four years old or something. So it's that. Yeah. It's, it's it's been that long. And, yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, every, and, and at every point in in our lives, we were always there. We were always playing a part in, in each other's lives, and that's always been absolutely fantastic. And even now, that uh, what well, might make sense for the people to understand. So, where are you living right now? Right now, I'm in Costa Rica, of all places. <laughs> <laughs> of all places. So that is for us, uh, as you know, I'm I'm located in the Netherlands. So. Costa Rica is um, well. It's not too far away. The the time difference is only six hours, but still, yeah, it could it have is, been worse. Uh, but it could have been worse. Yeah. Absolutely, you could have gone to let's say New Zealand or maybe something like the the west coast of the U.S. where you've got like a nine hour time difference. But yeah. Costa yeah, Rica, I just yeah, picked it in between. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you could have you could have you could have chosen worse places to uh, end up in, right? That's one thing. Definitely, definitely. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm all in with uh, the warm climate, and uh, <laughs> so I can't complain. <laughs> well, uh, part of you is still Dutch, so you can still complain. No worries. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. It's too warm. <laughs> it's too warm. That's always a good thing. So, um, as most people won't know you as being a friend of me. Uh, but there are other reasons why people might still know you. Could you tell us a bit on? how people might know you uh where they've come across your work how you've been well exposing your your creative self to the world yeah so most probably uh the band are playing Carrick engren been doing that for almost 20 years it's incredible <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> Getting so old. 20 years already yeah Jeez. 2003 yeah and um so yeah it's basically what yeah what you could consider a horror black metal band and um, started out really small as like a project and uh, has grown steadily over the years as you have witnessed as well you've always been an important part in uh, <laughs> helping and uh, yeah uh, going to the shows from the beginning and mm -hmm. so yeah right now we're very fortunate to be uh, touring with this band having six albums out already so a lot of people know me from that 
And yeah, slowly besides that, I've been working on, on other projects. Uh, I'm always trying to cook up like some solo things and um, mm -hmm. work with, uh, I see you wrote a bit in the down with uh, Lindemann, Till Lindemann uh, worked on his solo album. So yeah, I've been very fortunate to have been working on music all the time. And um, so yeah, that's it, I think right now. Absolutely. But still, yeah, yeah. I, I, as you said, you are, um, people sometimes ask, well, uh, so for those of you, uh, Clems and I, we know a lot of the same people. And um, yeah. a lot of people then sometimes ask me, well, hey, how, have, you heard any, have you heard anything from Clemens? How's he doing? And the one thing I always tell people, he's living the dream. He's living, he's living that dream that we, we've all had some, some time when you're growing up. Because some, and without any exception, everyone has had that moment in life where they said, I want to be a rock star, I want to be an artist everyone has had that dream at least once and you'll live in, live in that and you've 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 invested in in that you've uh gone above and beyond to um to attain that that moniker you might even say so um for maybe just to start from that of course yeah I, I, and of course I've, I've i've seen this up close and personal but what was your first recollection of actually being inspired by music? Thank you. Yeah, um, it has been present all my life. And um, yeah, we, <laughs> you probably remember we were singing <laughs> choirs when we yeah. were. Uh, I hope you didn't mention normal. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but still, yeah. Not, this is not what I want to talk about. OK, <laughs> but, uh, no, but like when we were we were fortunate, I think that we were in, in primary school. It's called right that mm -hmm. we had some kind of music education and some kind of introduction to that. And I remember the I was probably six or seven or five. I don't remember correctly, but I came home and we had been practicing or singing some songs in in, in school. And I had this little sort of casio kind of keyboard like you everyone yeah. has had one probably or seen one like display this toys basically and i remember i could recollect the melodies from the songs and i played them on the keyboard and i was fortunate that my mom i think was recognizing that like that i had fun with it and somehow mm -hmm. you liked it and from there it sort of started that you know uh, got keyboard lessons uh got a bigger instrument and that has been inspirational from the very beginning yeah. and uh, yeah so that's yeah. that was a very clear starting point i think yeah, yeah. it's just one thing I, I i wasn't sure of but um my recollection from those days was also that when you wanted to do any sort of music lessons at that time you had to start with the recorder the block flood was that, was that yeah yeah well that, that that's the same for you right that that's where you had to start yeah a year it was mandatory and um and basically also writing notes theory that was mandatory and i did it mm -hmm. and um and yeah that was you of course you a lot of people wanted to skip that you wanted to get to your instrument immediately but yeah now looking back to it i'm grateful because you know you 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 had to practice this instrument and you get confident when you master it somehow and you had to also write down the notes you were playing and get mm -hmm. some basic understanding and which was kind of cool and also during that year i had to think like okay what am i going to do afterwards mm -hmm. because i could decide to play organ or piano or the keyboard which was and yeah <laughs> it was early 90s the keyboard was a kind of a new mysterious thing like in the yeah. era of a, a digital instrument and um so e eventually i chose that and, and and went on with that yeah yeah because i remember from those days even if people within so uh, again a bit of a backstory here um uh, so yeah. we w when we were growing up uh, we lived in a, in, a in, in like the smallest town there is in uh in the netherlands called vel uh w-e-l-l -L, and um we had a lot of fun there uh, but yeah. my, my recollection is was even if you wanted to learn something like guitar or drums or anything else anything that had anything to do with music you had to start with the recorder 
And yeah. I think that that also was off-putting for a lot of people when they said, well, I don't want to play the damn flute. I, I just want to I just want to bang on some drums. I just want to shred on a guitar. And yeah. even though, as you said, when, when you started music lessons, you were like seven or eight, um, then it might have made sense from a uh, educational perspective to have that foundational education when you start need to have that yeah let's yeah. say the the basic understanding of music theory and all of that but if you if you look back to that do you still think that that was a a right approach not really i think nowadays um, you know kids should be able to to get excited about an instrument and, 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 and get on track immediately. And I think this was a very conventional thing. Like there are a lot of conventions in particularly <laughs> music education yeah. that um, are can be off-putting. And, um, and also like back in the day, for example, those music lessons and the instruments, they were very expensive. And I was fortunate and I was very <laughs> made very much aware like, okay, if you're going to do this we're going to pay for that but you have to be very serious about it and yeah but it was not for everyone and you know sometimes i think that's sad i think maybe some people were indeed like you said uh, put off by that and then mm -hmm. didn't have the introduction to a, another instrument i think those things have changed i haven't really looked into it now but mm -hmm. yeah so it's a mixed 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 idea yeah definitely absolutely yeah and, and then of course nowadays um well every everyone can can go out and say, well, I want to teach people the guitar or play the clip or uh, uh, teach them the drums, of course. And uh, we were fortunate yeah. enough that we had some exposure to people who took things very, in, very, very seriously from the start. And as yeah. you already mentioned, well, now that you already <laughs> mentioned the uh, the children's choir that we were both seeing, in, but that was also quite formative. Uh, at least uh, that, that, that's how I experienced it. And um, well, you already alluded to it as well. Where we might say, well, that was something that taught us a lot about things like harmonies and uh, and those things as well. Even though we were we were like seven, eight years old, something like that when we started, right? Something like that, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it, it, I mean, it was very helpful, I think, to be in those choirs, and uh, it was very formal, formative, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it helped us in our, in our idea of what music is, what it can be, and um, I mean, eventually, we <laughs> both of us developed into completely different directions, music-wise, than what we were doing there. But that was not the point. Absolutely. You get an idea of what singing is, what an instrument is, and. I think that's really, really great as a Absolutely. kid to encounter those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. indeed. Yeah. And and then you, then you already well you already opened that door to the next piece of piece of music education, and that is of course uh, back in that day when we were uh, in the choir and all of that. That was of course a complete polar opposite of the things that we later on developed uh, into. Um, but could you remember anything from? what kind of music you were exposed to next to that um maybe just so people understand a bit of what where you are coming from and then we can take it from there well i have always liked um, um soundtracks a lot mm -hmm. you know yeah. movie soundtracks i even remember in well you had like the the local harmony and they would play even like soundtrack movies and stuff mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a vague memory of that and that has always inspired me. And then later on, we were growing up, I started listening, you know, punk and uh, rock metal. And, uh, but somehow those worlds were mm -hmm. completely parallel for me, but they were not connected. So I was having my keyboard lessons, so to speak. And there I was practicing pop songs, classical music. And then the whole metal rock genre always felt to me like something. Yeah, I didn't see keyboards in there. I even remember like um, in the beginning I was just playing drums on my keyboard because yeah that, at least there was something metal going on yeah and it wasn't yeah, until geez. oh geez I remember yeah. that <laughs> yeah I was like oh. a drum beat and, yeah uh, indeed it was, yeah yeah and it was only until that I really got in touch with the you know atmospheric black metal stuff that I realized hey you can actually combine keyboard sounds like ethereal sounds in in this kind of music and that opened and combined those worlds suddenly like instantly 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that was the next phase, I think. Absolutely. And, and, and you mentioned already, well, one of the first things I remember when you start to create your, your first music is indeed making sure that we that that that, that you were accompanying yourself on, on the keyboard or not just playing melodies chords and all and the whole shebang but also indeed incorporating uh the whole percussion set into it as well because of course at that time we were of course quite limited with what we had but that's yeah. uh that's of course great and then um maybe maybe talk a bit about how uh you got sucked into the uh punk metal black metal kind of world how were you introduced into that and how did that then evolve well um i think um yeah one of our uh, earlier friends is too, like marco he uh, yeah i think he was the one that introduced me actually into uh, hard rock mm -hmm. and uh, i think I, I i run into him in a, in a what was it called back then free record shop Mm -hmm. and he uh, pointed out some music and i think you and me before were already listening to green day green day um, of course and then and, uh, some, of, some of uh, oh yeah absolutely yeah the, the so early 90s uh, exactly punk revival yeah was. yeah but that was around yeah probably 12 when we were 12 or something right i think yeah because i think that it was still before that when green day uh visited vel that was a couple of years oh, before yeah. that yeah 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 that was uh and, and uh, but then later on we start to uh understand who these people were and then we started to listen to dookie and, and those kind of records of course and make yeah. sure that we um that we got into offspring green day and um offspring indeed yeah 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 so that was around that time and rage against very machine. exciting yeah yeah those were formative and years we we were yes. as you said we were like 12 years old just at the at the brink of puberty and we were starting to rebel and <laughs> yeah. do all kinds of things yeah, exactly. that we wanted to do absolutely and then yeah indeed, and then, yeah yeah but was it actually marco who, who thought who thought who brought you into metal didn't know that either. Yeah, and then we had many friends. Remember, in in, in school, that were listening to uh, different bands, you know. And we still had cassettes back then. Oh I yeah, remember, absolutely. Like, we, would, we would trade them and listen to them, and then um, you know, uh, you would. That's how I got uh, into different kind of bands slowly. Yeah. So, and I think that's also something like there was no yeah there was internet, but it was very basic form back then. But that was actually an exciting way you just had to talk to friends and you know like mm -hmm. trade cassettes listen to it and so one band at a time you were at least i was getting into this and exploring yeah. it what did i like what not and that was very exciting back then yeah 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 and, and and as you said uh the internet was something well it was around but it wasn't usable to download music because back then no. if you wanted to download just one song it would take you an hour so that limitation of exposure to to other music uh, yeah. made people very creative, of course, because I, I still remember, especially those first couple of years when um, even local bands like Hey De Roches or Undeclinable uh, were still yeah. quite uh, well, formative for us because yes. it, was, it, it was something that we had access to. And then, of course, later on, when you start to... Uh, to listen to things like Sepultura, Soulfly, those kind of things, that was all. Yeah. That 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 was still, even though, well, those were quite established names back then. But as she also mentioned, yeah. uh, we had access to a record store. Uh, well, not that close by, but we had access to that. We were able to listen to music, and then we were able to discover that that taste yeah. going forward. But as you said so so those two tracks were quite separate for you so on the one hand saying well okay well i've got my keyboard i've got my 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 music foundation my musical um theoretical building blocks and i've got yes. that personal taste and as you said well, well finally at a point those things came together uh, do you still remember what was that aha moment that that as the germans would say the aha erlebnis 
Yeah, exactly. I think it was like when I list, started listening to bands like Cradle of Phil, Dimu Borgir, that was the first time I realized like, hey, you can actually combine <laughs> the strings patch on my keyboard and this kind of music. I've never heard it before. Yeah. And that was exciting. And we had a band already back then. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had this very basic uh, Yamaha PSR 210, I remember it. And it had like this, this like evil bell setting. So it was just like you put in that patch and it, it sounded already great. And, and then we were just messing around and like making riffs with that. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. That was sort of an aha uh, erlebnis for me. Like, <laughs> this is cool. Like, I can use my keyboard in, in this hard rock metal setting. And it's actually not just pressing the blast beat button. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. So That's I just I are. I just found a picture of the PSR two uh, two ten, and yeah. it is indeed a blast from the past to just look at that. So um, for those of you who are listening live, so we do have a companion channel uh, where you can just post links or images or any questions if you don't have uh, access to a microphone. And I've just pasted a picture of a PSR two hundred and ten there. And it is indeed, I immediately recognize that thing. Perfect. Yeah. And I remember I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have a bag for it. So I would just <laughs> put it on my bike yeah. uh, in the front and just, you know, like bike home, or was it? Yeah. To like 40 minutes or something. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that yeah. thing still, well, is it still alive or where, where is it now? That one I sold actually. You did? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, back, yeah. Fortunately, I shouldn't have done it, but uh, it wasn't. It was not so good anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, these things. I mean, they were great. Like in the in the nineties, like these things were worth a fortune back then. And you know, you could just press a button, have a drum beat, and and you had like samples. Um, it was not much of a synthesizer, but more like, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it had like onboard samples. So. But as a as a kid to to just press a button and like have a fusion rhythm going on or then a salsa or and then that's so uh, formative indeed that yeah it was a really great instrument yeah yeah indeed and and, and, and yeah, as you already said that's around the time when uh, when I mean you of course started to say okay well I want to investigate this further you start to play in bands um, could you. Tell us a bit more about how those first couple of years were playing in bands, uh, starting to figure out, okay, well, how do I actually start to write songs and how that whole process went from there? Well, it was very exciting because we were practicing basically or getting together, uh, you know, all the time. We had this little uh, uh, shed that's next to uh, <laughs> Marco. Yeah, you remember it, of course. Of course, yeah. yeah. And at his neighbors and they allowed us there to to practice and have a drum kit there and have our stuff there and i mean a lot of time it was also just hanging out but those were very very good years to just you know fool around and try to make songs try to make parts and we would record them even on cassettes i remember yeah and um and I think throughout those years, you, we really developed, you know, our uh, s uh, instrumental skills. So mm -hmm. playing guitar or keyboard or drums or whatever we were doing here. And also like playing together and seeing how you can learn from each other and, and form something. And it was, uh, you know, serious, not serious, but you, I think you need that. You need those those years to just mess around and see what's possible and, and mm -hmm. having fun with it. Um, already then we had some very rudimentary uh, computer programs, but it was very limited, like the internet, like multi-tracking <clears throat> mm -hmm. was not really a thing on your computer. You needed pretty serious hardware for that. Yeah. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I, and, and I think looking back now, this was really... Um, because nowadays, I mean, we, we can go online and the good thing about that is that you can study an instrument from YouTube and immediately uh, find a lot of more information, which is also has its benefits. But those times back then were also cool because we had not so much and mm -hmm. um, we were therefore forced to just uh, yeah, mess around. And 
I learned a lot from that, I think, looking back. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, actually, just like, as you said, like the limitations that were well enforced upon you will then drive your own creativity. And that I think that's something that we've, well, um, for those of you who have listened to other and earlier episodes as well, a way we might see that the whole limitation approach is yeah. actually a driving force for creativity. So if you have access to everything, uh, yeah, how do you then choose what to use? But if you, if the only thing you have is indeed like, in your case, a PSR to ten, and uh, you you had like a single, well, like like we had back in the day, right? We had yeah. uh, we had a drum kit that was not uh, amplified. We had a single guitar ampl uh, amplifier. We had your amplifier, of course. We had a single microphone. And yep. occasionally we had a bass amplifier whenever we had a bass player, um, yeah. <laughs> but that 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 that's that's around it, right? So when you are limited by that and you don't have access to, and I don't want to say the old days were better than today because I think that as you as you already said, well today every laptop can run a DAW, a uh, any laptop can run Cubase or um, yeah. yeah. Uh, or, or f whatever you want, like Pro Tools or Ableton Live, everyone can run that, and everyone is, has yeah. has the ability to do that. But when you don't have access to that, when you just have to focus on the music, and don't yeah. have to worry about okay, well, how's it going to sound on a record? How is this going to sound on Spotify? No, the only thing we were interested in: how does this this sound right here in these in this shed or in this garage that we were playing in yeah and maybe yeah. we were considering well hey maybe how should this sound if we ever get to a point where we are uh, allowed to perform yeah 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 and also i mean it's hard to say like these times have have a lot of benefits and but the old times too so you cannot really compare mm -hmm. them but for me it was also important back then by discovering these bands the only thing we had were the cassettes or the cds yeah, and you had one or two pictures of the band, and you knew nothing about them. But that, for me, enabled me to imagine, like, wow, what these guys? What 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 were they doing? You know, what? How did they come up with this kind of music? You didn't have, uh, you know, online accounts to look at them eating mm -hmm. a sandwich. <laughs> yeah, for yeah, example. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's great now, and that's now the the benefit of getting involved more as a fan and and learning more about the artists. But for me. Um, Personally, it was very beneficial to not know those things and to just sit on my bike with my Walkman, listen to this music, and wow, this mm -hmm. what a weird sound! Where did it come from? And just get inspired by it. And um, yeah, but also to to make sure that you still had that larger than life um, image of your musical fans, whereas as today you can just go to yeah. anyone's Instagram and you figure out what they were eating for dinner last night exactly exactly yeah so yeah we they, they were heroes for me and for mm -hmm. us i think these people like and and you wanted to be like them you were growing up and you know i want to have that big keyboard or i want to have that that huge sound i want to be like them and that is inspirational in that sense yeah and then you have the limitations and uh i remember later it's really funny uh, thinking about it that uh, at some point I would finally be able to buy the instrument I had been longing for years and then it was kind of disappointing <laughs> because oh, wow. it had been this like golden pot beyond the horizon like oh if I just had that instrument I will be amazing and then you had it and like actually it's kind of sucks <laughs> the one I had <laughs> before was better and that's kind of a revelation sometimes <laughs> but that that, that 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 is quite later further down the line right because yes, yes, back and back in that day when and, and now we're, we're talking about late 90s uh early yeah. 2000s when um when at first you guys were, were were doing the whole band thing later on i joined and then of course yeah. you 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 guys uh well we all went our merry way um, yeah. But at that time, the one thing I'm, I'm, I'm still struggling to recollect is the whole creative process. And now that I'm, 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 I'm trying to revisit those things and trying to figure out, okay, well, how I can 
tell other people to ha well this is how you can be creative musically I, I i struggled to figure out well how were we trying to be creative because we had a lot of time just sitting around as you said just fooling around and just doing things and having a laugh but the actual creative process was never something really structured if i remember correctly no not at all and um I think we were all just excited about our instruments or what we were doing or the bands that we were listening to. Mm -hmm. And they were all so different. For example, yeah, I would listen to a part and or I would come up with a part at home mm -hmm. and you, you would bring that to the rehearsal room and someone else would bring a part and you would be forced to try to combine that or not. Or, yeah. And that's how we just were messing around with it or uh you know like uh, you would just repeat it and um and and a lot of accidents actually happened i never forget that um we had one session where we didn't record anything and it was amazing we like we sort of made a song that day and still to this day sometimes i think about it oh i wish we had a recording of that <laughs> which and then one we was that then? got to press the button or something uh, well, <laughs> but which, that was which... like how it was but which song was that then or was that was that with with me or with marco or who was that with Marco, I think, and you were there maybe. Um, I don't remember exactly, but we were making, we were making songs, and we had titles, and this was one of the was a, like a, a very long slow song, and oh, it was geez. really great. I think. Oh well, yeah. Now, now I remember. Yeah. No, that was when yeah. I had something like an epiphany for 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 a concept. Um, geez, what was it called again? last testament that's what it was called or oh, the final oh, yeah. the final yeah yeah, yeah 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 some yeah the final testament or the next or something like that and we had a couple yeah. of titles and then there was one song somewhere in the middle and we just jammed and that worked and we were never able to well we were never able to well, actually <laughs> recreate that whole vibe that we got back then no absolutely yeah yeah but, but how, yeah, how, there was some that? kind of structure later, like that we try to get titles and songs and, and try to somehow force it into a, yeah, nudge it into a formula. Yeah. Yeah. But how is that now for you? Because of course, if we, th these are all stories from, from 25 to 20 years ago, but of course nowadays things are, uh, for you, much different when you have a, as, as you said, you're touring the world you are well you're living off music so to say so how has that process evolved from back then in the early 2000s to where we are today in 2022 well yeah it has evolved a lot and um, it's interesting because most of it moved behind into the computer actually into the door Mm -hmm. And um, I, I sometimes, a lot of times, I long back to those times where you're not sitting behind the computer. So, yeah, actually, your latest recommendation of the Volca keys was actually brilliant because now <laughs> I'm getting away from it again. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, but that, like, uh, I'm um, I'm a Cubase user, and Cubase has been. Yeah, amazing from the beginning. Even in those years, I remember I was uh, recording at an uncle of Marco actually, and he had a very rudimentary vers version of Cubase. And um, so MIDI, Cubase, multi-tracking, that, that became like, you know, an, an, an hallelujah, uh, mm -hmm. a doorway into making songs. And, you know, and I've learned so much in those, yeah, tw what is it, 20 years, 25 years. So it's hard to to pick one, you know, certain year or development, but it has been, for example, the last five years, I've been working really hard to get better at mixing and production. And um, the years before that, it was more composition and um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's intertwined. It's like it's it's like you are now you are everything, right? I mean, you're musician, yeah. producer, composer, whatever you want to call it. And that's the exciting things about this time. Yeah. And and then from from a composition perspective, the actual creative part to um, to write music or to come up with melodies or figure out how things intertwine and how things evoke well or not evoke a uh, an emotional yeah. re response. 
how, how is that what's that creative process for you today and how is that evolved as well well for example in the early days it, it would always be very exciting to have a new sound or a new instrument or you know yeah. psr 210 and you had a you had a sound and you try to to come up with something and for example the first time you find out about something like a minor chord and then how mm -hmm. it develops into a major chord yeah it sounds theoretical but that can be very exciting for a couple of weeks that you are like fooling around with that mm -hmm. and you can come up with a part and then you're very happy about it now looking back on that you think like yeah that was not so special but the same thing is still going on i need to be excited about it because the trap is like the longer you do this you you're starting to cut corners because you know i know how to make a melody or like mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and and that's also sometimes useful because you know you need to produce things and you need to get to it but it's really exciting for me to to have something emotional uh, resonant so i may be excited about something i saw a movie or an idea or just a thought and you try to sit down at the piano and come up with something that connects with that and um sometimes that can be it can be any genre it can be classical it can be very melodic or it can be super dark or super simple and that's the exciting thing about creativity and um mm -hmm. but, but the challenge for me now is to sort of like get out all the noise expectations i have on myself or maybe others have from something and to just you know go back to the basic uh thing which is music is supposed to be exciting and um in a way emotional and um mm -hmm. so yeah uh, sometimes it was easier back into those back in those days because you were easily excited because there was something new and you had never made that kind of melody and now you're used to it so i'm always looking for that that next exciting thing that challenges me yeah awesome but then from that 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 challenge that you've find if you ever get into something like a um, musical writer's block how would you then yeah. trigger something to to invoke that creativity again do you have any go-to methods to well to, to, to trigger creativity as you might say usually it is getting away from the computer because mm -hmm. I said there are a lot and you're staring at the same door screen and um, usually for me it means that that i'm yeah, that i'm tired or bored so mm -hmm. you know uh, when uh, i feel that i'm personally collected connected to what comes out so uh, i go for a run that always helps mm -hmm. um, because then you you you, know, you re-energize and you can come back to it later and then suddenly you come up with a part or sometimes it's just taking a break like a couple of days yeah um there are other things like trying a different sound can be a very simple thing or um, just saying like some sometimes I wake up and I'm like I'm going to to make a children's song just because I want to because I'm over all the dark stuff for three weeks and then yeah you, you just like you, know, you you put a marimba and you make something funny <laughs> and that's it and, you know and then that it can enlighten you and it's like okay it's okay um listening to other music sometimes can help um so there are for me many methods um and it's a challenge because i yeah like you said i do it now full time mm -hmm. and sometimes before you automatically had that process like you had to do other things or you had a side job or you had school and then in the night you would come home and you would be full of energy and then it would be much more beneficial to sit down and come up with something so sometimes now it's a challenge for me to to be fresh and uh, have inspiration yeah so Indeed, yeah. Those are the methods, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, indeed, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming that that there is no one single magic or silver bullet that will trigger creativity for for everyone, of course. But still, it's it's always good to understand yeah. a bit more about how. And that's something I've heard from others as well, where they said, "Okay, well, we need to get out of the actual." um exercise of trying or forcing yourself to be to be creative and actually enjoy life or experience life even and yeah. then take that and, and and use that to start the actual creative process all over again and yeah that is of course one thing that you've applied to 
uh, to Karahang and uh, that's one thing that you've applied to your compositions all of the uh, the work you've done for other bands as well um, then maybe and this is of course one of the things that I start to talk about as well is there was a, there was a moment in life when you said and I and, and I, I still remember that point in your life where you said no I'm just gonna I'm t gonna take the deep dive it's gonna be music for me all the way and yeah. could you um for, as i said for me it's it's I, I know the story but for the people listening could you tell us a bit more about how you came to that point uh what the actual pros and cons were and how you then made that decision and and, and what you were thinking of at that time it has been a long uh, way in that sense like i tried from you know my early teens to make it my full-time um, occupation so to speak I did go a little bit different because like now we get back to the educational system I tried the conservatory but it didn't really mm -hmm. work out and um, I got away from that kind of disappointed mm -hmm. but I also then chose another path and I said I'm gonna try to make music work on my own terms mm -hmm. so I chose a profession, I studied social studies and I got a job in that, which, you know, I, I, I learned a lot and um, it was really, uh, I had some really great experiences there. But on the side, I always kept a couple of days per week. So I worked part-time for most of those years, mm -hmm. basically always. I developed the band, uh, my own music. And there came a point, I think it was 2016, where I could no longer combine it. It was just impossible because we got more touring opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then I just was like, okay, now I have to take that step because it's just impossible. I was touring so much that my job, uh, they were allowing me to go on leaves all the time, but it was just not making sense anymore. Yeah. So I quit and that was very uh, scary. <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> and um, but it just naturally worked and um, yeah ever since I've been uh, doing this all the time now yeah yeah uh, but as you yeah. said it was quite well you actually took the plunge and actually just went head first into the deep end of the pool and well you made yeah. you made you made it an extreme success of course and um, I think that that's something where and again sometimes people ask me well hey how is claimers doing and i as as i tell them well okay he's living the dream but the one thing i always tell them is but he has he has made it work he has he has invested and he has put everything in his life in well yeah in, 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 a, in a perspective to make sure that this works for him and i think that that is of course that amount of control that you took on your not just on your professional life but on your life as a whole making that plunge is of course something that i think that a lot of people would be able to learn from to say okay well if Thank you want you. if yeah no but still because, because I, I i i know you um probably <laughs> I might say quite 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 well and I understand all of the all the things that I had to do with with those kind of discussions and those kind of decisions but still you made yeah. it work and with a lot of talent but also with a lot of perseverance I might even say and and that is of course something where I want to go uh, after this is of course because you talked about okay well you had the work with Karl Angren, uh, you had the work that you then said okay well I do a lot of work for um, uh, for for TV for radio for uh, for other bands as well so how how did you run into that line of work as well? Yeah, um, well first thank you and. Um like you said like it's uh, it's living the dream but it yeah it didn't come without um how do you mm -hmm. say sacrifices my one might say i mean i don't want absolutely to sound dramatic, yeah but you make choices you make choices like absolutely um you know i i you know if you want a big ferrari or stuff like that then you make different <laughs> choices <laughs> of course yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but like uh 
but my goal has always been like i want to do this full time and to be honest like doing it full time presents new challenges like i just <laughs> reflected on that's kind of how life works like you long for mm -hmm. something and then you're in there and you realize like what well, now i can do it full time but sometimes i need to do something else to be able to do it so it's kind of funny but that's how you learn along the path yeah and um yeah i think like, like naturally i always like to to compose for movies that was always a dream of me and um yeah somehow i got into touch with people i i was able to to compose music for uh, short films um i recently did did one for uh also a friend of mine harko i worked on many uh, short films with him since 10 years already and that's also very you know very creative uh, relationship in that sense that he and very fortunate he always comes back to me and he has great ideas like for movies and um so that's yeah, so harko I, so um harko yeah. how is he called like, further, further like that harko whips yeah harko. he's a dutch yeah. uh, director and um I'll probably yeah, yeah, I'll need to figure I'll need to find him. Harko. Yeah. Well, Harko with a K or with a C. Yeah, with a K. Yeah. Harko. <clears throat> I can send W you link, uh, website. Oh maybe. yeah, I think I think I've. Well, let me just see if we can find him. Harko Whoops, for your producer. Well, I found his LinkedIn. Oh, that's perfect, always yeah. that's always a good thing, and then it's probably <laughs> going to tell me. Yeah, he's a second. He's a second degree, uh, for me. And it's oh, yeah, you, yeah. you and someone else that are connected with him. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so for example, and uh, so besides the work for the for the band, I always wanted to work on other projects as well. And um, so film is very dear to me. Um, but also like uh, making cinematic music, I've, I've really tried to to make that work. Um, and uh, I made some. Yeah, you could say solo works, and I have been able to publish them with uh, different publishers that basically try to get that music into the world of TV and cinema. So uh, a lot of times my music is used, but I don't know exactly where it's used. But <laughs> yeah, it's used. And it's cool. And uh, yeah, these are very exciting things, but they take yeah they take time and they take uh, work. And um, so um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I have learned by doing this is that. You know we are all somehow wired for instant gratification like you want to work and you want to get the pay at the end of the day but with my work that basically never happens and mm -hmm. uh, that can sometimes be challenging because you work and you work and you work and you have no idea when and if there is going to be a reward and what kind of way yeah but yeah, usually after years then things come together or you meet people or opportunities come your way and then you are like ah oh, that's really great so uh, yeah that's that's how it has been uh, going for me. Yeah, absolutely. But you, you, you touched upon an interesting point there um, by saying that we are indeed, and I wholeheartedly agree with that, that we yeah. are hardwired for instant gratification. And I, um, what we now see with the whole uh, consumer uh, approach going forward, where we see, well, if I want to see a certain movie i go to netflix if i want to listen to a certain piece of music i go to spotify um the yeah. whole instant gratification approach from a consumer point of view has of course let's say escalated beyond belief and yeah what is your thoughts on how that will then impact um the future generations of creatives how will they make sure that even though they might not get the instant gratification that they are well that they have expected to experience immediately how will they then make sure that they enjoy that creative process on its own well i, I think i only have one answer for this like there is no instant gratification in this because um and the instant gratification is the process it sounds maybe cliche but mm -hmm. um i mean i'm driven i'm and, and sometimes i feel this pressure as well you know like you you release a new album how many plays does it have how many views how many likes and then at the end of the day you have to just realize that this is, those are just people clicking on something but it doesn't automatically mean that people are into it 
Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can have very little views, but it can have uh, music can have a very meaningful impact on just one person. And I think we ought to try to step a little bit away from that. And um, mm -hmm. because it, it can be such a trap trying to think, f finish something very quick. For example, like this is just an example, like last week I've been making this super obscure kind of album that I didn't plan. I just was like on the Volca keys, like <laughs> making dark sounds <laughs> and just like, I'm going to do this, like whatever, you know, like I just want to do this now. And I worked hours and hours and, and it, then this came out and I was just, I'm going to just upload it and that's it. And some people actually yeah. bought it or listened to it. And that's really cool. But I had so much fun making it. And if someone asked me like why or how, then I don't know. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> it just happened. And that's sometimes so nice. And that's the core of, of, of music for me. Um, and and be, yeah. because it can be so easy to go online and get overwhelmed. I sometimes teach um, people, like some people, you know, they take lessons, piano or composition. And, yeah. and the, the main thing that I've heard is like, I should be like this or I should have that already. And mm -hmm. I'm like, dude take five years go and play with your instrument like really like don't even yeah you know post anything and and give yourself that time and um be creative I, I look it. yourself up in exactly. a room yeah exactly and but you go online and you see everyone posting things and uh, which is great i mean i'm not against it but you can get the idea like that you are behind and that's awful because everyone has something to say in that sense and people should feel the the time we have a lot of time to develop these skills and they take many years yeah. i mean i was awful at mixing before but i think the last four or five years i've somehow improved a bit on it mm -hmm. but it takes that time you know you cannot just watch a couple of videos and um, yeah. sit down and buy plugins because that's also the thing buy more <laughs> stuff the you, gear you gear acquisition it. syndrome yeah absolutely I have it too, but <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries. We are all we are all guilty of having that. No worries. Yeah, exactly, but the reality is brutal. That sometimes it's just very simple, and you need to just put in the hours or the time. And yeah, yeah. So if so I I've... if I were to summarize that, and I think that you you touched upon some very interesting points there, is that on the one hand that instant that drive for instant gratification. Um, let's assume I imagine someone being 13 years old and they just got their, their musical instrument and they are talented beyond belief. And, yeah. and they love what they do. And they go online and they see all this, well, let's just say, um, mcdonald's ready to eat music out there yeah and because that's and and don't get me wrong i i, I love that because i'm i'm just an uh, just a a consumer like everyone else um yes. but then of course a, a, after a while you, you you'll start to look beyond that and you say well i want to do something that is more pure that is more creative or that is more artistic and i think yeah. that on the one hand because you are then so exposed to the enormity of creativeness out there that it will only drive the creative process further and even though i think that going forward you'll see a lot more well uh, 13 in a dozen uh, artists going online but the ones that don't conform will be more interesting. And yeah. I think that, that that's going to be the, the major shift and the paradigm um, development in our time going forward in, for the next 20 years, where you'll see like the whole Pareto principle. We'll see uh, music being created for 80% of the populace by 20% of, um, of the artists and at the yeah. same time we'll see music being created for 20 percent of the populace being created by 80 percent of the artists and i think that that's yeah. going to be a very interesting development especially when i might imagine my kids hopefully one time taking up an instrument and trying to be 
or hoping to be creative and yeah, yeah it's going to be an interesting approach yeah and and you know i i always say for example like we we had something on school if you remember like <laughs> maatschappij leer or like jeez yeah those those kind of things and i remember like that that the te- it was very sometimes boring and the teacher would say like if you see a commercial someone with a sport life uh, chewing gum then you know it's not real right and now we're in an era where you go online and we maybe forget that a lot of the things we see are are like that you know commercial and um, everything, everything even is a commercial yeah everything yeah but you you can forget that even if i post something on my instagram or facebook you know you 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 might think oh there there is something again and uh, but all it's very difficult because all the work behind it and maybe also the the doubt the the problems they you cannot really make them visible i mm-hmm. we're doing that right now by talking about it which is great but um i'm i'm very th- this is something that's very dear to me like you you there is a lot of struggle and for example an album like uh the last album we did with Karach frankenstein i think it takes like two years to set up something like that and work on it yeah. it's so much fun but the end product is then there and um yeah maybe you know the mistake can be that people think oh that's just dropping and uh which is not the case and there was a lot of times where you when i'm just sitting here and it's like oh, nothing's coming out or mm-hmm. this riff is bad or you throw it away and um and that's fine you know i just wanted people to know that that's just the reality and um and that's cool and uh, i hope that somehow gets out there a bit and uh mm-hmm. that it does put people future generations off because learning an instrument is, can be difficult and uh, yeah. can be a lot of fun yeah no and as yeah. you said that's something that we need to make sure that yeah. anyone going forward whether you're eight years old or 80 years old if you want to take on an instrument or if you want to dive into any sort of creative exercise whether it's music painting uh yeah. sculpting you for, for one you, you're never too old to learn uh but also it's going to take time uh, i'm not sure who who said it first but um apparently it takes 10,000 hours to master any yeah. any sort of skill you want and whether that's mm, music uh, musical composition whether that's playing with synthesizers whether that's playing keyboards it's probably yes. around that same lines right so yeah that that's absolutely true and i think that that's something that we do need to make a bit more visible because today yes. everyone can go online see all these people with or yeah. without talents let's just keep it <laughs> let's just keep it at that yes. um yeah. who are then indeed making a lot of uh ruckus around creativity but at the end of the day creativity is a human exercise and i think that all humans and all people are creative at their core um but then again we need to, just like like just like with crude oil you need to have a good refinery to get the usable aspects out of someone yeah yeah exactly and, the, and another interesting thing is i i don't remember i read i read a book called the media is the messenger i think that's it's called mm-hmm. and that's also something that's just fascinating to me like that you know the the in this the platform where you present something for example spotify mm-hmm. or youtube or instagram it very much dictates the end form of the product so if you upload music to youtube or spotify yeah you know before we had the cassettes or not to be nostalgic about it but it was a different form and that dictated how we perceived that so this is something we should also take in, in, into consideration like as an artist you have a choice how to present it and you can work mm-hmm. with these platforms and maybe you say i don't want to put it on this platform maybe i'm going to put it there or yeah. maybe i'll keep it physical and i think that's also something to to consider i don't have a, an answer to it but it's maybe sometimes forgotten that people just put it online now and but sometimes maybe something you make is not really uh fit for a platform or mm-hmm. is better off 
in the, in platform X or Y or and uh, it, it's something to consider I think yeah well and I think that that's that's a nice thought there um, and I think that where we were initially thought to say well music is something universal independently of how you consume it um, the whole advent of <laughs> at first MTV when they were still playing music instead of pregnant teen drama um, we learned that music became something more than just the pure music uh, at first yeah. it was well okay uh, music videos and then we had the whole well the whole internet bang happened and the whole uh, online presence of a band of music became more important as well and now of course we see that it is going beyond that because the music on its own has become something transient almost because we don't buy yeah. albums anymore we listen to spotify and 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 just like we switch from one brand of cereal to another we can just switch from online listening platform to the other uh, but with even greater ease we can stop listening to uh to one band to another whereas when we were growing up you yeah you saved up uh, a lot of your hard hard earned uh pocket money and you, you bought a a record uh, and in our case those were typically cds and yeah. you would you would actually play them until they were gone um yeah. but then again today it's much more upon so what's the actual experience that you want so how is that something that you incorporate into into the whole thing because at the one at the one hand you of course you, you do that for Karl Anken but you also uh, do that for the the music that you write that people can just go online buy and use in their productions uh, but you also yep. work with a lot of other bands of course yeah yeah well, with, with other bands, it's usually like um, it's more fo following a brief, usually what they want, or it's orchestration th that they come f uh, to me for. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, let me think. You know, one of the things that's important for me is that it, everything I do has some kind of meaning. It has to be meaningful, not that it's bland or I'm just doing it yeah. like I said before. So if I can somehow put something in there, even though it's simple stock music, I always try to put something nice, you know, like that I think, okay, I did my best on it. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's a very conventional thing, but I put like a little effect there or I did that, this thing. And I just try to, I, I believe that that somehow works, you know, that, that that's a, a form of authenticity that people can pick up on or maybe yeah. someone that buys it for... Uh, and I like to think that way. Also, that gives me pleasure because else I'm thinking I'm just doing something routinely, and uh, that's that's a risk when you do this, yeah, you know, full time. And um, there's a lot of trends. For example, I, with Karach, you know, we like to make storytelling albums. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age, you know, I'm I'm aware that not everyone's maybe going to sit down and listen to the whole album because the algorithms are, you know, trying to get you out of. <laughs> Uh, a, a whole album next yeah song. yeah and so that's like a, it's like a little bit of a battle but you know we put so much energy into telling that story and to what track should go there and this part and going over and then that's like an artwork for us and um, mm -hmm. and and fans pick up on that and people like that so we try to protect that uh from the latest uh you know maybe th there's a trend to put out or uh, the single now or Mm -hmm. um, you know, like we are very aware of that, and um, so yeah. For example, Spotify is really, really, really great, but yeah, it, it also has its downsides where it can maybe ruin it a little bit that it takes you out of the album experience. But then yeah. you know, I'm I'm always trying to be positive. Then it's like, okay, how can you put? The spark of the album maybe in one song <laughs> so yeah and then and then like maybe actually. yeah maybe then coerce people to say well if you like this then you yes. want to listen to the rest of the story as well 
and I think yeah. that and and that's of course tying back into the and this is something I've been I've been thinking about is mm -hmm. Spotify is great for that instant gratification. I want to listen to the latest. Well, um, just, just 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 mention whoever's in the top ten right now. But if you want to have a full experience and. I know for a fact that Spotify supports this because you can do um, uh, things like uh, uh, podcasts, audiobooks, and all those kind of things. But if you do yep. get into something like a great concept album, like Karak Ungeren, like Arion, like well, whichever um, great artists you want to point out, um, and that goes. Well, even all the way to bands like My Chemical Romance, even who've done great concept albums. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, indeed. And I mean, it's very accessible, but it's also, yeah, as listeners, we 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 have to navigate ourselves and sometimes, like you say, stand still and and realize, like, okay, maybe this is something I want to explore further, and you buy it maybe as a physical copy or what I do, I go to. Mm -hmm. you know, Cobras or HD tracks and you buy the high quality version things like that yeah so yeah and that's rewarding with some things some albums yeah or, or indeed go out and buy merchandise something like that one of yeah. the yeah. the best examples of that is and this is something I've, I've never told you this by the way is the whole yeah. um, the whole uh, girl with the per pearl earrings visual yeah. Who, who came up with that? Because that is such an exceptional, brilliant idea, and I love it. But who, who whose idea was that? It was Heilemann who did uh, the artwork, and uh, oh, he geez. came up with that. So, oh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. you don't say. So so it's just, really, it is genius. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. is absolutely yeah. genius because it is something that incorporates, on the one hand, a bit of Dutch heritage. But at the same time, the the whole Johannes Vermeer artwork yeah, exactly. is is in its essence, well, at least to me, the uh, the definition of gothic, where you yeah. say, well, we want to have something that is excruciatingly pure from a um, f from an emotional point of view, you might say. And yeah. if you then just, and even if you look at the, I've, I've just posted it in the uh, companion channel. If you then just look at how that image was then, the overall corpse paint is that it's not that excessive, but it is exactly on point. Yeah, and I think that that, that, yeah, but that is something where I'm like, okay, well, this is the definition of what I call modern art where you take something that is very pure, very accessible, very recognizable, but you then just apply something that is new, fresh, and you might even say, um, shocking perhaps. Yeah. yeah. It is. Yeah, and that's also, yeah. as an artist, or like, uh, that's the exciting thing because we work on this music basically and then mm -hmm. you work with someone that designs or uh, makes drawings or artwork and then for example with Heilemann in this case I took him already early on in the process even with Frankensteiner I told him look this yeah. is the album the story and you know I I'm not really visual an artist so what do you think and then he gets going and he comes up with these things and that's really cool to me because then you share this experience and you see that that the thing that we create in music can inspire someone else to come up with visuals mm -hmm. and that's so exciting to see now but and, uh, as you uh, said that yeah. that that's where art becomes something of a uh collaborative effort where you say it's yes. it's, it's going beyond a simple uh let's say a one-dimensional exercise where it comes become where, where it starts to become multi-dimensional where you have a multidisciplinary team of people embracing these sort of things. That's that's yes. just great. 
but yeah, that's, they, that yeah. gives the fulfillment, you know. And um, mm -hmm. sometimes like, people that are like fans of the band, they do that as well. Like they listen and they come up with artwork or an idea, or and that's so cool to see, you know. Like that's mm -hmm. all outside of the whole marketing and commercial side of it. But that's like the on a on a human human experience level. Absolutely, and to me that's really exciting. So and, uh, what, what was the first thing you thought when you saw the first person with a Karag Angren tattoo? Like, oh my God, we better not blow it. <laughs> 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 uh, I knew it. Because uh, just, just, just to be sure, sure because I know that, uh, that Evo, he, he, had a, uh, he has a Karag Angren tattoo. But were there yes. fans before that? I'm not sure. I think he was one of the first, like, because he has he has had a long time, yeah. But uh, when you start seeing them, I was like, oh my god! <laughs> no, no, no pressure <laughs> whatsoever, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, perfect, perfect. When um, people say like, yeah, you always make the same album, saying I'm like, I'm doing it for the tattoos. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't dare to step out of the well. The the, the, the borders, zone. yeah, out of my comfort zone because I don't want to disappoint anyone with a with a tattoo. That's of course well, that's one reason, right? Absolutely. Funny story, like one once, like um, I don't remember exactly where, but someone came to ask for an autograph, uh, you know, on 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 their arm, and um, I put it, and I, I and I remember, like, yeah, I don't know if I put it that well, because it was very fast, you know. And yeah, of course, later, yeah. First in back like look i tattooed it i was like <gasps> oh wow <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's like but yeah i mean that's how it how it goes but it's like funny to uh yeah <laughs> sometimes you think, it is what it is right yeah better, better job, like. <laughs> but yeah well it's better than they tattoo it than they say i'm never gonna wash this arm again and then they just get frostbite and yeah, exactly. gangrene or something like that right yeah yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but still, yeah, no. Uh, well, uh, Clemens, that's what being a rock star means. So you you, yeah, cho yeah. you, you, you chose this life. So yeah, this is what you're in yeah. for. This is, what happens, yeah. this is what happens. Yeah, you have to consider people getting gangrened arms or getting, well, maybe uh, questionable tattoos, right? So, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> So I Sorry do to... want to I I do want to um, uh, talk a bit more about how you then as an artist, how you then got involved or um, made a name for yourself uh, with others in the in the whole scene, as you might say. So um, for those of you who don't know, Claimus has done a lot of work for. Um, as you already heard, Lindemann, but also an extreme one, other and other bands as well. Um, but then again, that's what being a, a full time artist means, right? So, how did you come up with uh, those kind of, on the one hand, connections, uh, but also how do you then make sure that you then have those things pay your bills as well? <laughs> yeah, it's good questions. Like, like yeah, Lindemann happened via uh, Peter Tatgren, who was at that time mixing one of our albums. Yeah, of course, yeah. For Karak, and he asked, like, uh, was actually a compliment because he asked where we recorded the orchestra. And then I said, like, yeah, yeah I did <laughs> I did it at home. So that was cool. And then he <laughs> said, like, yeah, I have this, this, this new project. It's a secret still, but we need some orchestra. So could you, could you help us out? And then I learned it was actually Lindemann they were working on. And got in touch with till and then yeah basically making orchestral ar arrangement based on their songs mm -hmm. and they had really great songs and it was really nuts what they were coming up with with skills and pills back then the album yeah. and uh with the english lyrics and uh, it was so much fun and uh, one of the first projects i actually was orchestrating uh in another setting it was very fulfilling and they liked it a lot uh, so we kept in touch and also on that album i remember that till was saying like could you try to make a ballad we need an uh, a yeah. one more ballad and i never really made a ballad 
so I really dove into it. I'm like, I'm going to make a ballad. So I came up with that. Like, was in the end, it was that's my heart. And yeah. um, they they put it on the album. So it was a great. Um, it was a great thing, you know. And really, you know, one might say like, oh, that's great, like big names, and that's all true. But it was also very fulfilling to work on because you know those guys they are both really passionate about what they're doing and at the end of the day they're also you know just guys working doing what they're very good at so mm -hmm. that's what it boils down to and um so yeah that that, that was really something uh, something cool and uh, i kept in touch i worked on their second uh, unfortunately their last album because now they uh, they went in separate ways but uh, yeah it is did what a lot it of is really cool it is what it is and that's how things go and uh but yeah wrote a lot of music and worked on a lot of things uh really great stuff so uh awesome yeah. so what is next for you then what where do you see yourself going into um over the course of the next six months year five years any any specific plans or do you just say well I'll go where my heart leads me or where the music takes me. Well, I'm very fortunate that a lot of the things that I that I wanted have actually happened. Like we've played, you know, great festivals with the band, did a lot of tours. We're going on another tour in May, again, for the first time in a long time. So I'm looking forward for that. And probably working on another album. But I'm now at a point where I'm also, in, like what you said, like I'm just going to see where... Uh, things are going to take me mm -hmm. um, I, I worked a lot on production music over the last years because yeah there was a pandemic and I took that time to work on that mm -hmm. and when you were talking about paying the bills those things yeah they pay bills <laughs> yeah like uh, I have you know music publishing st things like that and that's important as well and, and you learn different things from that so um, yeah I'm going to see from now, I, I I sort of yeah just go where the heart goes, and uh, <laughs> um, like I said, I sometimes just want to work on something that comes up, like I did the last weeks. I worked on this very gritty album, uh, yeah, turned into Dark Order, and I don't know. <laughs> and this also, uh, yeah, <laughs> I uploaded it. You know, like I I still get inspired by those old games we played, like Doom and Quake. Oh, jeez, yeah. It Absolutely. never leaves me, so I always have to come back to that. And now I, so the Trent whole Reznor made a phenomenal soundtrack back then. <laughs> yeah, indeed. But that that that's more importantly. So I'm just gonna uh, yeah. share your uh, your band camp link here in the companion channel oh, as yeah, well. Yeah. That's cool. um, um, okay. Well, <laughs> apparently uh, I read Tom's uh, mind. Uh, Tom three Tom uh, from three Tom yeah. modular. He's in the companion channel and he asked me, well, do you know where we can listen to Clemens' stuff? And I was just about to just drop the um, the Bandcamp link in there uh, oh, for cool. your uh, for your synthesizer-based uh, album. And yeah. that is, that's just great because that, that's, that's of course something that we, right now, where we have to think about, okay, well, how do we make sure that these sort of initiatives um yeah <laughs> tom now says read my mind twice in a row it's getting creepy no tom that's just uh great minds think alike but yeah you know what it, it is, is. <laughs> so uh, i would recommend everyone to just go online check clement uh, clemens's uh dark corridor uh, uh album there i've listened to uh, a lot of his work but again yeah if you've known a guy for 34 years what's their nuts like right <laughs> so, long so yeah. yeah jesus christ man um so one of the things uh as you already mentioned so you will be touring the u.s um from uh from april late april to early june right or yeah like end of may something yeah exactly yeah and then you're gonna go into uh uh Numi Jorafi in finland and then back to the mexico metal fest in monterey right or yeah yeah so we have a couple of things uh 
happening again, which is really cool. Oh, that's great. That's absolutely yeah. fantastic. So any news yeah. on uh, any European tours or is that all? Not yet. I mean, reps? things just came back to normal uh, just recently and hopefully stay that way so we can start to navigate on European shows again. Um, absolutely. So yeah, it's exciting times. and. Uh, but yeah, it was a difficult time for musicians over the last years. And uh, mm -hmm. like, hopefully we stay out of uh, more pandemics. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the one thing that I saw um, a lot of musicians doing during the whole COVID uh, thing is, of course, people started to dive into other, other media. We saw a lot of bands yeah. starting to do podcasts specifically in the punk uh in the punk approach where you saw a lot of punk bands starting to do podcasts uh but also as as you've done is taking a plunge into more session work making sure okay well this is what i'm good at this is where i'm going to be able to help out other bands as well to make sure that the whole creative process keeps on going and that's yeah that's of course that's of course great and again if you are limiting yourself you're gonna drive creativity yeah 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 and also something that i've discovered and that's also maybe for interesting to to take into consideration for you know other musicians or new musicians like especially when it comes to production music you know what i do is i put something out there and then maybe at some point someone buys a license to it and puts it somewhere and what sometimes happens is that something that has been online for seven years suddenly mm -hmm. gets for the first time uh, a use and yeah. it always makes me humble and reminds me like uh, we're going back to that instant gratification thing again but yeah it's, it's a fantastic feeling when you see like hey this is something that has been sitting on a web page for seven years and now someone found use for it and it always you know gives me a renewed inspiration to think like you know what i'm doing right now might have meaning commercial or like artistically in maybe many years and we sometimes forget that especially like in this mm -hmm. case we're artists like even in this online era sometimes things take time and uh, you know like uh, something you make today maybe dark corridor ends up in a dark <laughs> corridor <laughs> maybe it ends up in a better place in a couple of years you never know so yeah <laughs> no but that but, but then the most important question becomes is yeah did you see um the the picture from i think it was uh, yesterday morning of hans zimmer in his bathrobe with an oscar in his hand i haven't seen it no no. He had an Oscar for June, probably. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah. so uh, I just want to, I just want to know when we would expect you to be in your bathrobe with an Oscar in your hand. <laughs> oh, that's maybe ten years, hopefully. <laughs> ten years. So you heard it here first, folks. It's okay. going to be twenty twenty uh, thirty two when we're going to have claimants with a uh, an oscar in his hands and <laughs> but it's good to have a goal <laughs> no and the reason the reason why i uh, why i asked this is of course because i know um what uh people like hans zimmer but also some of the other great well uh, movie score uh components mean to you and that's one of the reasons yeah. why i why I wanted to uh, well challenge you in that regard as well. So of course uh, I told you. Well, we're going to do an interview of twenty, maybe thirty minutes, and we're almost yeah. at in the ninety uh, minutes mark here. And I I do want to open it up for the rest of the team in the audience as well. So I've got my two last questions ready for me as well. Yeah. So my penultimate question is indeed um if you were to be able to go back to that seven maybe even eight year old clement who was just on the brink of his um musical journey what kind of advice would you give him um be patient it's gonna be fine mm -hmm. <laughs> i think that's uh 
because like yeah i think that's like a main theme we've been going over now like it can things can seem daunting or you want to be at a point quicker than mm -hmm. what you maybe can do realistically and now looking back i think like yeah that would be good good advice for myself back then like you know it's gonna be fine <laughs> it's gonna be easy. fine yeah yeah oh that's a nice one that's a great thought and then of course i've been bombarding you with questions and even though this might be a bit of an odd question for you but i've, I've done yeah. this with all of my uh shows up until now and that is yeah. always to give people the the chance to ask me any questions so i'm quite i'm quite intimidated to give you that chance as well <laughs> so what's your question for me well um how do you feel about music now that you have built this incredible channel because i think that's really something great that you've been doing in the last uh what is it almost, yeah one and a half years right and yeah uh, even even Nita shorter was really than exciting that. to follow and uh so has it changed your it's very broad maybe but perspective of music because i know you have been a music fan always and into music so i was curious about that like how that is That's a, that, oh thanks thanks a million clarence um yeah i think that for me always i've always been well jealous is not the right word but always envious of people like you or others that did indeed take the plunge and invested into that formative approach to music and i've always had this this this, this approach or this um this hesitance to take my love of music that to that next level because i've always been a yeah. vocalist i've always I've always I've never stopped singing I've always gone out and I've always been with uh, session uh, musicians I've I've done session vocal work throughout my life but I've never taken the plunge to actually learn a an instrument and I yes. think that what has now deemed to me is that learning an instrument goes beyond just your personal understanding of musical theory yes. and yes. that is something and, and and i just love the the talks we've had over the course of the last couple of months about sound design about yeah. uh, synthesis taken about and and that is teaching me okay well even though I'll never be <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll never be up to a point where you are in regards to musical theory but on a level of sound design or uh, or sound uh, synthesis that's that's probably something where I can indeed be creative and I think that that's yes. something I'm, 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 I'm truly grateful for to finally understand yeah yeah that's really cool to hear yeah yeah and i'm glad you found that uh it took, whole new it took me uh, th 37 years but i finally found it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it was pretty great and uh yeah you see like i'm now uh, with the volka keys uh, <laughs> yeah so yeah <laughs> I, 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 I i finally I, I finally were able to get at least someone into uh, the whole uh, uh gear acquisition syndrome so for those who you, if you, those of you don't know so um uh, when was it when you were last here like a couple of months back and yeah, we so were just we, we were just jamming on these uh these analog synthesizers i've had laying around and one of them was of course the volker keys which is a great anyone who's ever considering hey i'm not sure if analog synthesizers are for me buy a volker keys they're quite affordable uh, but they do come with a very big disclaimer if you buy a Volker keys you know for a fact you're gonna go into the rabbit hole head first and I can confirm that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs> and it is just a, a phenomenal device to get into analog synthesis and what i then yeah. see is of course what well, well, the, the one of the things that we were talking about uh, earlier this week is how do you then get from 
the Volker Keys, which is primarily a an East Coast uh, synthesis device based on a lot of the, um, um, the the principles that Robert Moog put into place. So it's all yes. quite, yeah, you might say, um, yeah, it's all, it's all quite deterministic, uh, but at the same time, it's also quite, um, well, reductionist. And if you then compare yeah. that to the West Coast thing that we were talking about, the Volker uh, modular, that's, mm -hmm. of course, completely West Coast, uh, Don Buckler, uh, Surge kind of uh, additive synthesis. Yeah. Completely different world, of course. And it was so interesting because f and basically I up until now I've always worked with the, the VSTs in my DAW. You know, a couple of uh, really cool synths there. And I always had this wish like for this kind of gritty sound and this analog sound. And I've looked into it myself a couple of times and I saw, for example, like uh, guys like Trent Reznor with uh, oh, Moog, yeah, wow. Mini Moog Voyager. But it, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's, that's an expensive instrument, you know, maybe another time and then I would just go on. And then you started this channel and you came up with these things. And then I, now with this Volker keys, it does exactly what I want because I want to make like a noisy sound and I can just pull it, dial it in and it's incredible. So yeah, it's really cool to see how these things come together. And now- Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty fun. So I've got, I've, I've got the, uh, I just got my Volker keys right here. And this is probably, pro well, you might even say that the Volker keys might be one of the reasons why I started this channel. But if I grab the, where is it? The Cork NTS-1, which is a digital synth. That's also one of the one of the main reasons why I started this. And yes. it's, it's, it's a great, um, well, it, it it goes to Korg to make sure that we want to have these sort of instruments into the hands of people who might not even know or understand what they're doing, but it's a great mm -hmm. approach and I love them for it. And I do have to say, I love other brands to go out and making these things accessible as, as well. Um, Definitely. Absolutely. So, that being said, well, as I said, we're already at the uh, uh, 94 minute mark. So uh, okay. let's have a quick look and see if we've got any questions from the live audience. And at the same time, I'm gonna have a look at the companion channel and see what kind of questions we've got. Um, so let me just read these out loud. Um, this is from Tom. I guess music made in the shed suffers less from concerns about what others think about it. I would think you're making music for yourself. Well, I have to agree with that. If you're making music into a shed like we did with Marco's neighbors back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Definitely then we were doing it for ourselves and for pleasure and fun and yeah, mm -hmm. and, yeah learning about the instrument. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. And, uh, but yeah, nowadays, of course, there is more of an awareness, like, okay, there's people going to listen to it, but um, one doesn't have to bite the other, I think, you know, you can still be aware that what people may expect, or especially with Karach, for example, mm -hmm. you're not going to make like uh, Latin music. <laughs> it's like, so, but yeah, you still, I always try to enjoy the music I'm making because else I don't know mm -hmm. you will give up quickly you know if you're doing something against your own will or that you're not enjoying it yeah at the same time you try to make something that's enjoyable for others hopefully as well yeah yeah, yeah. no but I think that that's 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 a good point where you said okay well how is that gonna take a part in the overall vision of things how is it going to fit in? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So then uh, we do get another comment from Tom. Well, okay. He likes that we are also in uh, inviting artists in, instead of just doing uh, gear manufacturers. 
um, Tom also asks, can you ask Clemens about transitioning into being a musician full time? What did Clemens do before going full time? Well, of course, we did touch upon that uh, as well. Um, yeah. Then we've got a good question from Z4. Um, how do you see pro bands going for revenue due to streaming and the price of materials increasing in general slash the environment? How do you think they will go to a predominantly Patreon, etc., uh, medium for fan support? Is that something that uh, you and Dennis are talking about as well? You mean going more online and, and mm -hmm. to the Patreon kind of model? It's funny because we have never really been into it. <laughs> we are like mm -hmm. a little bit maybe old fashioned. Also, when the pandemic started, a lot of bands were streaming and and live kicks and stuff and uh, we mm -hmm. talked a little bit about it but in the end we yeah we didn't really gravitate towards it so we sort of skipped on that yeah um this boils down to basically also the previous question like sometimes like for me it's very important at least at this stage in in, in my life and i think for dennis the same that you know um do you like what you have to do and sometimes you have to do things you know like yeah of course yeah uh, to promote the album and you have to post on social media and, and and all of that that's just part of the job but those things you know i was like okay do i have do i really want to go on a, on live streaming and do i want to be on patreon and, mm -hmm. and we sort of concluded like nah it's okay you know like we, we skip on that and that's also liberating as well that you can decide to not do well, those things well and especially once you once you took a conscious decision to do to, to do not do that that's one thing because if you yeah. just leave that up in the air then people don't know then you'll uh but once you t take a very conscious decision and you can then communicate that very clearly well we're not going to do this this is how you yeah. can support us as a band, namely A, B, C, and D. It yeah. works, right? Yeah. It works. And um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> and, and sometimes I see this with, with artists that, um, I mean, not to be judgmental, but sometimes I think some it's, it's a risk to jump uh, too quickly on the newest trend. And um, for me, it's always important to, to try to step back oh, and see wow, like, does yeah. this uh communicate with your core values or the values you set out for the band or the the direction and um yeah so for example the last Excellent. album we did it, it worked really well and people listened to it and that's great and then you know I, I'm, I'm very grateful for that and then you slowly go to the next thing that's how we like to do it yeah yeah absolutely and i think that that's one of the things where you might say well uh, this is this is how far along you want to go and this is what you don't want to do because of course if you want to, if you want to do everything yeah you're probably just too busy just maintaining an online presence as opposed to just do what you want to do and that's music right exactly at least for me and for us that's very important and it's also some bands, like when we started out, we made studio reports, we were online a lot, and that was a very exciting and new thing. And it should be like that. But we are now uh, in a phase where we are more like, okay, the band mm -hmm. is going, and, and we don't need to be online every day, and it's not what we want to do. And other bands like that, and they have more of this, you know, um, maybe influencer kind of type, uh, going on and they like that and that's really great but that's yeah. what you have to consider for yourselves absolutely and um, for me it's very important to for example with Karach go go behind the scenes make a great album and then come back and say here it is guys and this is what we've been working on and uh, yeah. and it works for us I it's not that we're losing people or that uh, you know fans <laughs> are unfollowing or things like that so I do hear some dogs in the background so that's always good right? uh, there are a couple here that's what you get from moving to Costa Rica right so with all the noise yeah. weather you do get dogs 
and dinosaurs, right? <laughs> and dinosaurs, yeah. Isla Nublar. Yeah. Isla Nublar for, for, for the win, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> this is an inside joke, and I'll tell the rest of the people later on for this. Um, so then we've got uh, a question from Tom. Uh, could you drop some links to where we can listen to Clemens' stuff? Uh, you know, for lazy people like me. So I've dropped a link to your band camp and to karagangren.nl and to clemensveyas.com and then the the works list. Is there anything else you say we should uh, list for the people listening to this? No, I think that's really great already and uh, very complete. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, then we have uh, from 10 May. Um, hey, that's me. I can't play a single, mu a single musical instrument well. I missed the first half, so sorry, it's a retreat. Do you have any good networking tips for uh, working in the music industry specifically? Synthesizers are more patient than people. <laughs> Well, there's this idea that you um, have to, you know, network and, and and reach as many people as possible, and and I think that that is one costing a lot of energy and two doesn't work so well. Mm -hmm. One tip for me would be to you know pick out maybe a handful of people you would like to work with um, or things you would like to work in, and then study those contacts if you will and, and reach out to them send them an email and be honest and say like this is what I what I have this is the music I do and yeah and do that consistently it's better to, to write a couple of emails every two weeks for example than to write 100 uh, and then not do it for six months so if you do something on a long time consistently that will eventually um, lead to results and Another tip is like the, the the relations I have, you know, managed to build up over the years. They're based on sincereness and uh, empathy and an in genuine interest in the other person you're working with, because that's what, what I like too. And that's, you know, so it's not just like, oh, I want to get my music out there. I want to be famous or whatever. Like, for example, like filmmakers I work with, you know, I'm interested in what they're doing and that's how you establish a connection. So. I think mm -hmm. that's often overlooked. It's easy to to get into the do these ten things list, and uh, <laughs> then you will succeed. This, yeah, that we're the, back at the McDonald's. Uh, uh, yeah, where everything is just yeah. uh, consume as much as you want, exactly. right? So those are three things I have that come to my mind. Like, yeah, no, but still, I think that the whole approach of being sincere being interested yeah. and also making sure that you have a laser focused approach to what you want to do that's of course great yeah. and now i'm going to say something that you won't agree with yeah it's the same in sales <laughs> <laughs> it is yeah no, it but is it, it is absolutely yeah, it is. yeah it is when you I mean, make sure yeah. that you and of course when you're doing it from a creative approach the uh the overall um outcome that you envision is of course different but still you yeah. want to make you want to broaden your horizon and that's how you do this um yeah but that, but again um ten may great great question and i do love that and then we've got a question yeah. from Krinsk. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Um, question for Clemens. Was there a big difference in recording a demo like the Chase Fault Tragedy as opposed to something more professional and full length like Lum and Dumb? Great question, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. The Chase Fault Tragedy, yeah. That's <clears throat> 2003, 2004. Then we were basically, yeah, nowhere in terms of, yeah, a band, and but we were we were rehearsing in a 
caravan <laughs> you remember it too maybe well it, it used to be our shed and we then moved it to your mum's backyard well so, yeah i do remember that <laughs> yeah. oh exactly. that, thing, that, that thing was phenomenal don't get me wrong yeah 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 and so i had this old computer uh, a, a, a very simple behringer mixer and that's how it was recorded and um well, mostly one takes and um but the process was in itself the same like we were making songs we were learning about this legend the traceful the chase fold mystery like this, this the, the the graves the the vault that uh, had like coffins that got messed up without an explanation it was really mm -hmm. interesting and we thought back then like let's make a a release based on that story it was like four tracks five tracks four tracks i think so the core was the same with lamanam it was much more professional in the sense that we had our first record label manning media we were recording in a professional studio with a good friend of my patrick damiani tidal wave studio and that was a big step up but the essence was still there um Jay's fault, yeah, we did ourselves. I did most of it, like, in terms of recording and mixing it. And, uh, yeah, that was very simple back then. But mm -hmm. it, was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, and people picked up on that as well. So it led to everything else that came after. Yeah. Absolutely. And, of course, yeah, you already mentioned uh, uh, Damiani uh, and the role that, that he played in, well, not just what you guys have done, at the start of the of the band but also later on that's yes. that's of course been phenomenal and i think that well uh, on a personal level uh, uh well patrick did a great job back then absolutely definitely yeah he's phenomenal uh, musician producer and um he really you know people forget that sometimes there are a lot of people around a band that help a band and uh put effort into it and add creativity so um yeah that definitely made lam and dam for into what it is and uh yeah. it's a great help and on every album he has been present in uh, absolutely in yeah. Sports. Yeah. yeah so uh that's really important um awesome. also like a like a last test basically when you did all the work and then you go to record and then there's someone saying maybe you should do it like that or you know, it's small changes, or but that can really make a big difference. But that, yeah. but as, as you said, that's the that's the true test of a um, of a musician as well, where you can truly get honest feedback, even if you're at the ninety nine percent mark, where you get, hey, well, this is something you can slightly improve upon. That's of course yeah. what you need, right? yeah yeah and it's also funny to tell like um i did a, a another solo uh yeah record last year and i had him mix it i had the funds for for him to do it and yeah. so i had him on board as a mixer because i can mix it myself but i know he's much better yeah and he was gladly doing it and it was so much fun because i sent him the tracks and he mixed it and every track was just perfect there was no one change so it was really oh. funny like. <laughs> and uh, we both didn't expect that you know we we knew that we were some somehow synced and that and uh, so he would mix it and he would also sometimes you know make make some bigger changes look in the sense that some things were louder and i would listen i would like phenomenal i would call him like do you want me to change anything I'm like no okay next one no <laughs> it was really cool but that's what you get after no, all those that, that, years that's the yeah. that's the the cross pollination you get right when you yeah. when you start working with people that you know and trust over these uh, over that amount of time so yeah um i do want to open it up for live q a as well i haven't seen anyone raise their hands yet in the audience no. So I do want to open it up. But in the meantime, while we wait, um, so uh, for those of you listening live, there is an option to just raise your hand and I'll get you up on stage and you can ask any question you want. But in the meantime, we can just uh, keep on talking. Um, yeah. So this is, 
on the one hand so for those of you who, who, who don't know this and we did mention this previously claim has moved to Costa Rica what was it like three years ago four years ago it's uh, a little over a year but I've been here for many times and months in a row yeah, yeah indeed the, f the first time you went to Costa Rica yeah. was in the very first time was in 2014 already with the Jesus, band. Jesus, yeah. We had a show, and uh, that's how I also met my wife. So <laughs> that's a yeah. uh, long time coming. And uh, yeah, and then afterwards, uh, especially 2017 onwards, uh, 2018 onwards, I went back more times. And uh, during the pandemic, I, uh, I ran off. <laughs> entirely no yeah. you just did, didn't did run off you, you just said well n life is nicer here so why don't i just pick up and leave no you you did the right yeah. thing <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. no worries no worries there whatsoever so i think that from a questions perspective i haven't seen any raised hands yet uh we did yeah. get of course some questions from the companion channel and yes. well we are almost at a 400 percent overrun of what we expected to do from a an interview perspective so yeah. uh, clemens uh, again i do want to thank you so much uh, for your time and just for making some well just for taking taking this call and just to talk about these sort of things and of course we talked about a lot of things that both of us know know a lot about but I do appreciate it very much because I think that even for people who who are, might not even be into metal, who might not be into uh, music production, but I think the the lessons you've learned will go a long way for people to well to actually help them drive into a more creative approach in their lives. So I do have to again thank you so much for that. And of course, on a personal level, again, thank you so much for everything Good. you do. Thank you so much for all the creativity. Thank you so much for all of your support. And um, yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you have always been uh, one of the greatest support in my uh, careers and the difficult decisions. You know, I would call you for advice and that's something people should know as well. We've been friends <laughs> uh, since we were born. <laughs> and, oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm very proud of you, the channel you build. It's really inspirational. Oh, thanks like, so much, man. Like, and how it's growing. And uh, it was uh, completely a pleasure to do this uh, anytime. And, uh, oh, thanks so much, um, man. Appreciate it. it. Thank you. That being said, I do want to... Oh, I think that we do get one final comment into the channel. Um, yeah. Oh, this is going to be the last question. Then, uh, from 10 May... He's asking about the favorite module slash VST. Well, as you are still a, quite a virgin in the modular synthesizer world, so I would just say, what's your favorite VST then? Wow, oh, that's a good question. Let me think. Well, I have to. I have to give the guys from uh, East West Sounds Online credits. Um, they have basically built. Uh, incredible VSTs, uh, Hollywood Orchestra, um, orchestral uh, samples. And they were, you know, one of the first and they're, what they are really good at, like when I started with this, you needed really a powerful computer to run this stuff. And that was yeah. also kind of cool because, and the software was sometimes not really stable. Um, but, but anyway, I liked it so much what they did and their recordings of the samples are so intuitive. Nowadays you have so many more uh, things on offer, mm -hmm. but they were one of the first and the quality of their recordings is uh, phenomenal. And when I play those VSTs myself and work with them, it feels like an instrument. It's not just a collection of samples, it's oh, real. Awesome. And, um, that has helped me a lot, so that would be my shout out for them. And um, yeah, uh, that's really great. And on synthesizer level, Zebra, uh, I know that uh, Zimmer uses it as well. Uh, Zebra is one of my go-to synthesizers as well. And uh, phenomenal, uh, phenomenal plugin. Yeah. So that is the Zebra Two um, from Yuhi. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll need to look into that. Yeah, uh, let's have a let's have a quick look. So you've got a. Oh, let me just make sure that. So I'm I'm immediately linking all of these things there as well. So I've linked. Uh, I've uh, I've done the call out to uh, East West Sounds on soundsmodular.com and yep. so what I look at what I see from Zebra is you've got a single oscillator with two envelopes you've got a comb filter what's the XMF oh cross modulation filters oh that's nice and then yep. you've got two uh, LFOs and you've got You've got a second. Oh, you've got four oscillators. Uh, oh, yeah. You can um, make incredible bass, but also like noises, and um, you hear it a lot in the the Batman movies from uh, Christopher Nolan. Similar okay, great. Right. Um, if you yeah, like he did, he did, he did exceptional work on those. Don't get me wrong. Absolutely. Yeah, it's phenomenal stuff. Uh, Interstellar as well. So Zebra is, is at the core of that. A lot of people don't know that, but it, it is. And um, mm. I use it a lot because just for bass, like on the last album, Zebra is a lot there. Um, yeah. Great lead, spooky sounds, uh, noises, bass. Uh, and um, there's great patches already available. I mean, sometimes they just work and you and it's also cool to tweak with them. And, um, we we really need to get you into the whole modular scene and we need to make sure because everything i yeah. see here in zebra it immediately translates into hey but i can do this in modular as well exactly yeah. <laughs> i have to build a room i have a spare room here so we can <laughs> okay well uh, just uh, just apologize to the teach uh, uh <laughs> on my behalf in <laughs> ahead of that because uh, i don't want to be responsible for that <laughs> Oh, yeah, sure, sure. No worries, no worries. Um, that being said, oh, here we go. Um, Zebra is great, but not nearly for the same price, and especially not polyphonic. No, that that's something I can agree with, uh, Christian. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So I do see some last-minute comments from people, so just give them. A last chance. Yep. Krinsk is uh, typing something. So now I'm just curious to see what uh, what they're yeah, saying, right? <laughs> One final quick question without giving too much information. When can we expect new Karak Angren music? Ooh. Well, there is already uh, quite some uh, music written. Mm -hmm. um, but we are sort of pulled in different directions as to what we're going to do with the story or so I'm like it's more like uh, all out on the table and uh, some, of the, some of the music is already is a little bit more old school and there's also some very new ideas actually with some synthesizer stuff in there but more like the Frankenstein album mm -hmm. and so there is there is music on the table there's no release date or recording date yet but we're working on it but we're taking it step by step uh, yeah so uh, stay awesome. tuned <laughs> stay tuned well you heard it here first folks this is what yeah. you can expect so yeah. then Krinsk um, at, at Arts um, awesome thanks so much for your time well I can only agree with yeah. that Clement so again thank you so much for doing this and i think this has been great and for those of you listening live um this has been a presentation of the modular clubhouse i do have to thank claim as again for uh, for his time uh this will be released on youtube uh the link will be shared on discord and on all other social media um I'm still working on possibilities to release these as actual podcasts. So if you've got any recommendations, feel free to reach out to me uh, where you want to see these. For now, we'll just say with everything going on in the world, make sure that if you have a, a chance to have a positive impact on 
uh, on all of the refugees currently make sure you do so and at the yeah. same time yeah just make sure you're safe you're healthy and if there's anything we can do to help let us know right for now yeah. take care cheers